start with Gina at the end. Sure. Um, two seconds. I'm already out of time. All right. Done. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Gina Martin-Adams. I run the equity strategy team for Bloomberg Intelligence, and I also operate as the chief equity strategist. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Caio. People usually call me Chow. You can see from the, the way that the name is uh, spelled. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm a quantitative researcher at, uh, at Deutsche Bank. I'm Peter Bookvar. I'm the chief investment officer for Bleakly Advisory Group, which is a wealth management firm based in New Jersey. And uh, I pay, pen a daily newsletter called The Book Report. Uh, Danny Tenengauser, Head of Market Strategy at BNY Mellon. I have two roles at the firm. One is to look after our uh, massive uh, uh, flow database. We'll be talking about it in a bit and uh, covering global macro. And I'm Bob Savage. I run foreign exchange sales at Bank of New York Mellon and I write a daily piece competing with uh, the, the book report called The Morning Call. I've uh, been doing that for 30 years. Um, not that I'm old, but uh, paradigm shift was sort of the topic, and I'm going to throw this out there, which is um, risk parity models, the idea that you could throw bonds into a portfolio and hedge equity downside risks, um, you know, has led to a 60-40 portfolio analysis and the idea that maybe if you put in some energy or oil, um, you might be able to have a perfect portfolio that would withstand the test of up and down times. That's all blown up this year. That portfolio is down 9%. Ciao, or Kyle, you, you're nodding. Which portfolio, you, you, you make these things up, right? These quantitative strategies. Which one is working right now? Yes, so um, just to give a bit more background, uh, a lot of the work that we do in, in quantitative investment solutions and QIS research is to um, build portfolios for clients that provide a specific type of, uh, specific, a specific type of hedge, right? Be it um, a, a hedge against certain macroeconomic scenarios or um, uh, more uh, unconditional type hedges. Um, another part of the work is to, to build um, alphas, if I can abuse that term, right? To build alphas that are supposed to, to, to perform under uh, a number of, of macro regimes. And in addition to that, to work in portfolio construction and risk estimation that brings everything together, right? 60-40 <clears throat> um, was, uh, was indeed pretty popular, and in many ways it made the life of quants easy and he made it very hard. He made it easy in the sense that all we needed to do was, was to come up with, was to come with some kind of estimate of how, how bonds and equities were going to be negatively correlated to each other according to regimes. Um, and hard in the sense that it was something that was quite difficult to beat. Right? So that made our life, uh, our life a bit more complicated. Um, but now that we're moving into a regime that whereby you can't assume that hedge Right, the, uh, the the so-called Fed put um, uh, may not be working in the future in the way that it has in the past. We have to think about other types of, of solutions. Um, and again, in the past, the the type of problem that was very popular was how can I hedge equity downside? That equity downside was specifically linked to um, was specifically linked to uh, recession slash deflation type shocks. So if you think about, about the, the key macroeconomic uh, drivers, right, macroeconomic factors, growth and inflation, and you set them up in a, in a 2D type of a framework, we're looking at the bottom left of that, of that uh, 2D matrix, which is growth down, inflation down. That was the kind of thing that we needed to, to protect against. And if you're thinking about protecting against that, then basically buying duration had done just fine. Okay? Duration, also buying uh, equity optionality, optionality in other asset classes, and so on, but for a simple solution, just by duration. Okay? Now, we're moving from that bottom left of the quadrant into the top left of that quadrant, which is growth still down, but inflation is up. Right? As you move into that, you can no longer assume that duration is going to hedge against it. Uh, <clears throat> Then the next question is how do you how do you construct something that 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 performs in that kind of environment? And what we find is that often you have to resort to scenario analysis, and that scenario analysis often has to include simulated data 
uh, because you haven't seen enough instances in the past where you can you can basically uh, uh, you can basically uh, um, uh, see stagflation at play, right? For us, what throughout the, the through, through our studies, right, which which involve some quant techniques and also a lot of common sense, right? What we have found is that long break-even inflation, long defensive trend following, okay. Um, long uh, puts, outright good old equity puts, and finally long vol. Okay, so these four things are the kinds of things that we see as performing well in a stagflation environment. And I can spend another 30 minutes explaining how we get to that and how do you solve for the problems that this basket portfolio is going to give you. But before that, let me, let me pass it back to the speaker, to, so to the moderator. Excellent. So. Stagflation. Are we in a stagflation environment or are we just in a capitulation? Uh, I'm yeah. scared the world is ending because, uh, you know, the list of paradigm shifts, war, pestilence, famine. I, I think it largely depends upon your definition of what stagflation is. I, you know, I think that uh, we certainly are in an environment and have been really since mid-year last year in which growth was slowing or the rate of growth was slowing and the rate of inflation has been picking up. Does that define stagflation? It's a very different type of stagflation than that which existed in the 1970s. Um, you had the exacerbating impacts of policy being misplaced for a, a, the better part of the last year and trying to play catch up to economic reality of a slightly slower pace of growth and much faster than anticipated inflation. And that's created a tremendous degree of volatility. I think we're moving into an environment where secular inflationary conditions are faster than that which we've become accustomed to, but very unlikely to mimic a period in the past because we are in a different period. Every cycle is different. Every recession has different characteristics. Every recovery looks different. So I think it's a little bit misplaced to look at the 1970s and say, OK, hey, yes, that's exactly where we are today. That said, I think you have the combination of, you know, extended geopolitical risks, an environment of uh, accelerating nationalism around the world, and climate change, a recognition of climate change and a regular, regulatory response to climate change, all a confluence of factors that creates a much faster pace of long-term durable inflation that we're struggling to kind of price in the market and we'll continue to struggle to price it. To me, so far this year, we've really just priced a transition in rates. And you see that through factor performance very clearly. The best performance in the equity market has been a long short duration portfolio, uh, followed by a long short value portfolio. But really what's, what's happened in the equity market is long duration stocks and short value stocks are underperforming materially. We've seen very little outperformance of short duration and high value so far. And I think if we're moving into an environment where we have to contend with more inflation pressures over a long term, you'll see that trade continue. But really, so far to me, what we're seeing is just a rotation based upon what's happening in interest rates. And the shift in interest rates has been vicious and quick. Uh, at least as far as the bond market is concerned, trying to anticipate what is a very different looking Fed over at least the next year. But have we priced that sort of big long-term regime change? Are we pricing in so any sort of massive stagflationary environment emerging? I don't think so. I also don't think those things are likely to emerge. Instead, you see a very different inflation landscape and we've got to contend with that in our portfolio strategies. But to me, this is nothing like the 70s. We won't repeat the 70s, just like we won't repeat the great financial crisis recovery. And unfortunately, policymakers generally designed policy to fight the great financial crisis in an environment where that is over and we're now fighting a new kind of crisis. So Powell isn't going to be uh, growing a mullet. I got it. <laughs> you and I had a little tete-a-tete -tete uh, about the bonds market pricing in a recession, right? Um, it, are bonds leading equities and are we already in a recession? Well, interestingly, right now, the bond market, if you, were to, if you were just plopped on earth and looked at the yield curve, you wouldn't think it's necessarily pricing in a recession. 
Yes, you can say its pricing and is slowing because of the flatness of the curve, but when you look at the actual yields, you would sort of say the opposite, and that's what makes this very interesting. And I think Gina made two important points. Number one, one of the characteristics of the 70s was high, very high unemployment. They had the misery index, unemployment plus the rate of inflation, where today, of course, we have very low unemployment. So it's stagflation, but in a different form. And then also, it's important to understand that and talk about fighting the last war. We entered the COVID, we're actually we really post-COVID, we enter this inflationary world on an economic foundation created by central banks of, let's create an easy money environment to generate economic growth. And keep in mind, what changing interest rates does is it encourages people to borrow. At the end of the day, that's all it does. The Fed lowers interest rates. It tries to encourage you to take out a mortgage to buy a house or take out a loan to buy a car and do it today instead of waiting till tomorrow. So we pull forward economic behavior. But over time, cumulatively, that leads to a lot of leverage, higher sensitivity to changes in interest rates and the cost of capital. It inflates asset prices. So now we're entering a world of here's this foundation of economic activity predicated again on cheap money, a lot of debt, and now all of a sudden, cost of capital is higher, central banks cannot use the same playbook, and this is coming off very high valuations. So it's not just an economic adjustment in order to deal with consumer price inflation, it is an asset price adjustment in response to the rise in, in cost of capital, inflation, and the inability of central banks to, do with, to use the same play playbook as they've been using, which means that you re-rate the multiples, you now are in the process of sort of re-rating profit margins as companies have to maneuver in this more difficult economic landscape, and if we are entering an economic slowdown, which I think we are, then you start questioning, well, what's revenue growth? And on the equity side, that makes this a, a more difficult investing environment. And just to a point about the whole 60-40, and I'll throw it back to you after that, is that you know, we talk about 60-40 being the ideal allocation because stocks and bonds are, 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 go their own way. But when you think about it, the last 40 years, they went the same way. Stocks went up most of the time, and bonds went up most of the time. They were positively correlated. Bonds separated themselves, though, in equity bear markets because it well outperformed. That's where the cushion came in. So here we are, instead of both going up, they're both going down. So over the last 40 years, most of the time, they're positively correlated, and they are doing the same now. Danny, you've been very patient. Um, but does nominal growth matter? And are people just too bearish on equities? Because it, I've had high valuation, I've had stagflation, um, I've had, this isn't the 70s, but I I'm not sure that the fashion is going to be pleasant to, tr to trade. What, what do you think the environment is right now? And what, are, what is your data set telling us? Right, so, <clears throat> so uh, let's start from the nominal growth story. Nominal, can, yeah, okay, good. So uh, nominal growth, I mean, nominal growth is, um, it, it cleans, it, it helps, right? So uh, let's start from the fact that um, all the fundamental analysis that we all do are, are ratios to GDP, right? So if all of a sudden, and, and that GDP usually is normal, nominal, right? Well, it's not usually always nominal. So with that nominal GDP increasing, um, uh, a lot of the fundamentals improve just by definition, right? So uh, when it comes to debt ratios, when it comes to uh, household debt, uh, you know, uh, financing, uh, uh, corporate revenues, cash flows, all those things tend to improve a lot with, with higher, uh, higher inflation and higher nominal growth. Um, so, so that in itself should uh, help us out a lot, particularly when it comes to the tightening of monetary policy going forward. Uh, the Fed will not need to extract that much liquidity, right, given that nominal growth is very strong. All they need to do is to reduce the pace. Now, um, what we've done that connects uh, probably everything that I heard in this panel together, uh, we actually aggregated a very large data set of flow. So uh, we looked into 
all the net buying across all equities in our database. So, uh, so just to give you an idea how big this is, um, our database basically includes $45 trillion of assets. Okay, so I'm going to say this again, it's $45 trillion of assets, okay? Um, about 30, 35% of that is equities, right? So we're talking something around 15 to $18 trillion of uh, equity flows, right? I don't think you have a flow database that is as large as that, um, period, anywhere. And then what we did is um, we tried to understand what is the marginal impulse, flow impulse into equities, right? Um, and we put that against something else because, again, we are trying to understand whether people are buying or selling equities against something else. And this is equities around the world everywhere. So there are two options here, right? I mean, the, the old-fashioned option is let's pick duration, right? I mean, now I want to buy duration because I'm a 60-40 and so on and so forth. But, well, but actually buying duration right now is dangerous, right? It's a risky proposition because you're losing money if inflation goes up. So let's actually look at the basket of safe bonds. And then what we define as safe bonds is less than one year maturity in the US, Canada, UK, Switzerland, Germany, France, and Japan, right? And what we, what we, what we saw when we launched this index, we called it iFlow Mood, um, is that the, the index was just going into danger zone. And this is like February of last year. We launched the framework uh, uh, about a couple of weeks before uh, the war in Ukraine. And the thing was obviously tanking, just crossing a threshold where we called it danger zone. It just kept going down and down and down. And the interesting thing is by the middle of May, it actually reached a bottom that was below the global financial crisis, right? So this is not below the great lockdown, it's below. So it's essentially the lowest ever, right? Which basically meant that people were buying short duration bonds like there is no tomorrow, right? Uh, which is really, really interesting. So my proposition is that we should have actually a fifth factor in your model, Kyle, that is not necessarily anything that you mentioned, right? Which is floating rate notes, right? Floating rate notes. Right. What, what, are, what, what would I qualify as floating rate notes? Well, right now you can buy, for instance, um, a five-year tips and be paid to belong inflation at 50 basis points. Right? It's a floating rate. Basically, it will move with inflation. Right? And you're paid an additional 50 basis points on top of that. Right? Um, you can actually, you, you should have actually premium on buying a floating rate, any, any instrument that is floating rate. Now, the interesting thing is that this isn't effectively being played out in markets. I mean, again, the T-bills are trading at a premium, significant premium against everything else, right? And the point be being here that I, I think that people are still underweight the floating rate product, right? They shouldn't be thinking in a risk parity framework as the long duration stuff. They should be thinking in terms of inflation protection through tips, through inflation protected notes everywhere else in the world. All right, so we've kind of all agreed that things are a mess, that the paradigm definitely is different, but everybody has a different answer as to what you, you want to own inflation protected notes. I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, Kyle, that, uh, that we're in that stagflation environment yet. Um, let's talk about the rest of the world. Gina, that's your specialty, right? You're, you, you get to pick on the US mostly, but it is, is part of the problem here that we're divergent? That for the first time, China actually looks like it's a mess and not growing uh, as fast as the United States, dare I say? And um, that's unheard of. So d d isn't that just deflationary? Isn't Asia the place where we're supposed to be? If you're worried about inflation, do you want to be overweight Asia? W w yeah. What about the rest of the world? Well, first I'll just say there are areas of the world that are working magnificently in the equity market. They just happen to be the areas that haven't worked well for 20 years because we've in that, been in that environment, environment of disinflation or deflation. And as we've reset to an environment that is potentially more inflationary, you're seeing areas of the world that are net commodity pr producers as opposed to net commodity consumers perform very, very well. Latin American equities generally up over the course of this year, some in emerging markets uh, in the Middle East and Africa, 
even you know, the non-financial components of Australia and Canada doing very well as a result of the fact that there are commodity producers on net as opposed to commodity consumers. So there are areas of the world that work. Unfortunately, our, our economic or our market reality is that we got bloated in long duration stocks that perform best when rates are falling and you're in a dis disinflationary regime. I mean, you got to the point where even just in the US market, tech, media, and telecom became 40% of the market cap share of the S&P 500. That's only a stone's throw away from where we were in 1999 when they were 45% of the index. Globally, you got to a point where your average duration of a global stock was more than 20 years. 10 years ago, that was 15. So we very clearly priced and became very bloated in areas of the world that are most subject to correct, correction in a period where rates are resetting and inflation is resetting. And that creates this confluence of you know, very negative global equity market returns at large. But there are pockets that are working. We've seen this even just very close to home here in the US with energy sector performance just you know, blowing the cover off of the market so far this year. Material stocks generally doing OK. Utility stocks doing well. Dividend payers doing OK as well. So there's areas of the world in the equity market that are actually working. But you couldn't have been caught sitting on your hands just expecting your tech stocks to perform well. And I think that's the, what happened. We got to the point also where this group was excessively overvalued relative to the market, where not only was the market more concentrated in this group, but this happens to be where all the valuation premium in the equity market was concentrated. So we go back a year from um, a year ago, and you're looking at the top five stocks in the S&P 500 trading at a 50% premium to the S&P 500 at large. Prior to the crisis, they averaged a 20% premium. So we have to reset that in an environment where rates are going higher. And I really do believe that's the process that we're going through is this longer term reset. That doesn't mean that equities don't work. It's just our concentration risk was so high coming into this that you have to have a rebalance of the equity portfolio and move to areas of the equity market that basically became dormant over the 20 year period in which all we did was see interest rates go lower, inflation disinflate or even flirt with deflation, you're going to be out of balance for the next, I believe the next longer than six months, which is what we've been through, but probably for the next 10 years, you're, as you move to a different kind of secular environment, you're going to wanna to shift your portfolio accordingly. It reminds me a lot of the 2002 to 2007 period. For some reason, every investor kind of forgets what happened in that period of time. In that period of time, equity valuations globally were flat, really didn't go anywhere. Stocks still rose, but the leaders in the equity market were value-centric, inflation, commodity producers of the world. It was driven more by China's ascension into WTO and growth prospects emerging, but supply constraints were a big part of that cycle as well. Global equities, frankly, did okay, but your leadership was very different. And I think that's the type of environment we're moving into now. So, Kyle, you're one of the things in your four pillars, the four horsemen that you were talking about, I'm not saying it's apocalyptic, but um, one of them was long volatility. And yet the VIX actually is not flashing, you know, Armageddon. It's telling you perhaps it, we've capitulated and it's time to buy. What, what, is, what is your view on th whether the volatility is part of this rotation trade that Gina's been talking about, which is, hey, we have, we have five stocks that are just misvalued, overvalued, and it's gonna be painful, but we don't know when they're gonna be revalued and reset, and that's the volatility? Can you, um, can you expand on that yeah. scenario? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so one of, one of the things I liked about, uh, I liked about your comment was that the, was, was when talking, about, when referencing valuations, and I like that because it often, we often, you know, have to, are challenged in trying to explain why is value, value stock, why are value stocks doing so well in, in an environment whereby uh, growth prospects are, are down. Uh, and this, a lot of it has to do with the fact that the anti-value trades, so in other words, the short lag of that, of that value trade, they are the ones that are selling off by even more. And they're selling off by even more because 
because they started from a from a very high peak, right? So valuations are are a key uh, are a key thing. Um, so I, I like that comment too. But, um, talking about uh, volatility, um, I, I, th I think there there are a couple of things there to to there are a couple of ramifications there, right? So first, we're seeing more macroeconomic volatility, macroeconomic momentum that leads to higher price volatility that leads to to um, uh, uh, and, and that in itself leads to a, uh, a certain number of investment styles to do well, most notably trend following. Okay, so if you're a trend follower, you would have had, uh, chances are you would have had a very good 2021, chances are you're having a very good 2022, and, and so on. It's the type of investment style that, that does quite well in this, in this kind of a, of a regime. Um, but you were referencing the VIX more specifically. I think there are two things there to, to separate, right? One of them is the volatility aspect of it, for which um, the way I look at it is more compared to you know, the past three, five, ten years and, and, and so on. And I wouldn't find volatility relative to that history particularly low at the moment. But second is the sentiment aspect of it. Okay, so what is, what is it telling us in regards to sentiment in itself? Um, and there I would make, I would, I would open up a, up a challenge. Is the, VIX, is the VIX the right measure to assess sentiment in a heavily multi-market, multi-asset, integrated uh, uh, financial market, right? I would bring in variables from other markets as well and uh, try to estimate, try to collect a risk barometer, construct a risk barometer that looks at it more holistically. A lot of the risk that we saw, a lot of the risk that we saw being priced into markets wasn't really in equity markets earlier, right? It was coming from the interest rate market, then it translated itself into the currency market, right? Especially with the Japanese yen and, and so on. And now it's, it's becoming a bit, a bit broader. Uh, and from that perspective, I don't think that we are pricing rosy days going into the future, right? I don't, I don't think that, uh, that that's what's, what's currently in the price. Peter, are we too bearish or are we um, rational on this group? Because, uh, you know, he, the, the VIX isn't at 50, but um, it's below 30. Is, is this a time to be wary of equities? What, what, are you, what are you telling your clients about portfolio construction here? No, I, I think we're being realistic. Uh, and, and I think Gene is right. When you, when you think about the U.S. market, let's take U.S. GDP is about a quarter of the world's GDP. It's about 24 trillion nominally. Global GDP is north, just north of 80 trillion. But the U.S. stock market over the last 10 years became almost 60% of the, of the global market cap. And as tech sort of just took all the oxygen out of the room, leaving everybody left for dead. And what we've seen in the history of markets is what outperforms over a 10-year span usually underperforms in the following 10 years. And I think we've reached that point. We are particularly very bullish on emerging Asia. When you think about the world being 8 billion people, 4.5 billion are in Asia. So if you're a global investor and you're not looking at Asia, then you're not really looking at all the different opportunities. And yes, China's got its issues. And what they're doing and their, when their approach to COVID is obviously quite different and disruptive from the rest of us. But the size of the Chinese middle class is going to go from 300 million people to 600 million people over the next five years. It's a lot of money that's going to be spent on things. The Indian economy, you have 1.3 billion people. There's a growing middle class there. In Indonesia, there's 250 million people. There's a growing middle class there. So to us, this, this growing wealth in Asia, looking out over the next 10 years, will be beneficial to their markets that have essentially done nothing over the last 10 years. I mean, even the Shanghai Composite, which has its own characteristics of being very retail-oriented uh, and not really correlating whatsoever to, to earnings and GDP, it's down 50% from where it was in 07. So we think that there are opportunities there and that the value trade will well outperform growth. And when you think about growth and you think about what evaluation rethink means. I mean, we had stocks in tech that were trading at 40 times sales, okay? So understand that 
in the nine, late 90s, 10 times sales was considered a lot. Because when you buy a stock that's trading at 40 times sales, and let's just say the company paid out every dollar of those sales, it would take you 40 years to get back your investment. And that assumes no cost below that. And Scott McNeil in the late 90s who ran Sun Micro gave a similar example of what it means to pay 10 times sales. Now when a 40 times sales company goes to 20 times sales with no change in the fundamentals of that business, that's a 50% decline in the stock. If that 40 then goes to 10, that's a 75% decline in that stock with no change in the company fundamentals. That is just a rethink on valuations. Whereas a value stock that's trading at 12 times earnings, can it go to 10 times earnings? For sure. But that decline is obviously much more muted than a growth stock. And a value stock already embeds low expectations in it. Assuming you're not in a value trap, assuming that you're not buying a cheap stock, but with deteriorating fundamentals that will not recover. Because in a bear market, which we are clearly in, those that lose least win. Those that limit their losses win. And you do that by being in value, you do that by being in shorter duration things, you do that by holding a bit more cash than you would otherwise. Because at the end of the day, bear markets are actually the best time to be buying stocks. You know, one of the things about, we talk about 60-40 or even 70-30, that forces you to be fully invested. You don't hear anymore about, oh yeah, we have some cash. On this. Cash is, is, is dry powder. Cash is optionality. And we're going into this bear market with investors that are fully invested. And they don't have that dry powder. And they're constantly reinvesting in bull markets and paying higher and higher multiples. So I think we need to look at this bear market and, and try to focus on where are the potential opportunities because that's where they arise. I mean, Berkshire Hathaway stock fell 50% multiple times when going back to the 1960s. It, it's just what happens in markets. And that, but that provided him with tremendous opportunities because he had a longer time horizon than everybody else, of course. Uh, but that, that's one way of looking at the investment landscape, that it hurts while you're going through, but uh, stocks get cheap and that's when you want to buy stocks because p paying low now provides you the better returns going forward. Paying high valuations in tech just really damages your future potential returns. Danny, Peter opened the emerging market door, and that, I know that's near and dear to your heart. Um, is Southeast Asia the, the place, or what, 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 what are your opinions about, A, what we've seen in emerging markets, because they haven't really been a, a wow performer, um, and what do you see in the future? What's your crystal ball showing? So, so a few observations. I mean, uh, the, the first one is, um, is, is, let's focus, like we've been talking very long-term stuff. So I, I would like actually to come home and think about like right now. Um, th there are two legs that we saw in the sell-off when it comes to flows, right? The first one was what happened heading into the bottom of that same global equity versus short duration index that we have. Uh, in, in that leg, what we saw was basically dumping everything. So the usual behavior, I, I want to sell every single equity market, uh, buying of US treasuries, um, a, uh, and, and buying of US dollars against pretty much every single currency. The interesting part is that since the middle of May, when, when the mood turned, and again, the mood is, is our, our iFlow mood turned, things actually started to change a little bit. So A, um, it's not clear that investors necessarily want to buy dollars across the board, which shows some sort of geographical, at least the desire to think about geographical transition, right? That what we're talking about here. Um, um, B, and, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that other G10 central banks are tightening monetary policy. So here, ECB is a very important catalyst going forward, how quickly they hike interest rates. A stronger euro is, is good for emerging markets, right? Um, uh, and, and the second thing is that we started to see the first equity markets to be bought were in Asia. Right, so very much in line with what we're saying here. People are tentatively trying to dip into Asian equities, even Hong Kong equities, funnily enough, um, China onshore equities, 
Korean equities, uh, uh, Singapore equities, are markets that people are trying to dip and go long um, across the region, right? Um, I think that a big driver of that trend to gain impetus going forward will be what happens with China in the second half. And here there are two things that we're watching out for. A is whether the love affair between Xi and Putin changes a touch, right? Um, whether whether Xi actually focuses on his next term, right, on basically actually entering into his next term and focusing on the domestic stuff, trying to dump a little bit the foreign policy side, and uh, whether the leash on the zero tolerance uh, gets released somewhat. So those things could be very supportive into the second half of the year, which will define what's happening within Asia. Now, taking the picture out of Asia and looking elsewhere in the world, um, despite the negative political news that cons con continue to come out of Latin America, we're very excited about Latin America, right? Um, and the reason why we're very excited about Latin America is because uh, central banks in Latin America have been extremely hawkish. Um, every single market, despite the election's uh, results, proved to actually show checks and balances that will uh, uh, contain moves that are true dramatic either to the left or to the right. And we saw that to the right in the Brazilian case. We saw that to the left in the Mexican case. Um, these central banks are very advanced in their tightening policies, right? Um, and most importantly, they are far away from the mess and they produce stuff that the world needs right now, i.e. food, right? So Argentina could essentially provide all the food that the world needs if they put their act together. Brazil definitely is already uh, replacing many of the food resources out there. So again, when it comes to Latin America, that's a, a kind of like forgotten region in the world that people, uh, people are not watching out because of the politics. Um, I would be very cautious about EMEA at the moment, with the exception of South Africa, which I think is also a buy. All right, so this was about paradigm shift. We have five minutes, so I'm now going to go and give everyone their minute to round up um, everything. It's interesting that the paradigm shift in my world is that I started um, 35 years ago at J. Aaron, and J. Aaron was a premier commodity trading house. And there was a desk of traders, and then there were four desks of people doing logistics actually getting shipping contracts and insurance for those shippings and making sure that port fees were done. Um, my paradigm shift is that we're back to that world where the hottest commodity seat for anyone in financials, every client that I meet says, do you have somebody that knows how to do this stuff? That actually knows how to get stuff from point A to point B in the most effective and e uh, efficient way? And the fact is, we don't. Um, we have a lot of uh, displaced views about, well, energy, it's transportable. Well, maybe it's not. You know, we, we actually have a gasoline shortage in the Northeast because of that. So um, that's my paradigm shift. What's yours, Gina? Yeah, I think my paradigm shift is quite similar. I would just pile on to that thesis because that thesis is one of the reasons that that sort of case of global supply constraints being somewhat more permanent or more semi-permanent than anyone imagines is compounded by the fact that you have this have climate change a regulatory response to climate change which is further constricting supply of general energy product forcing a transition to new types of energy product that combination of more infrastructure investment, more investment and supply chain constraints of the traditional product add inflationary firepower to that sort of geopolitically supply driven um, kind of story that's been playing out in markets. That together results in a longer term inflation regime shift that looks, makes our environment look very different than that which we just came from, results in emerging markets dramatically outperforming the rest of the world short duration stocks performing significantly better than long duration stocks, inflation sensitive plays in the equity market become the predominant drivers of performance and anything that worked in the last cycle is probably not gonna work even after we get the valuation reset for those stocks because of this kind of bigger paradigm shift in inflation. Um, 
Kaya, what's your paradigm shift? Volatility? Um, Okay, I may be playing my own book here, but I would say, um, let's say more uh, smarter portfolio completion solutions, I think. Uh, um, and that is something that we increasingly see with, uh, uh, with the client base. And, and I'd like to start, I'd like to elaborate on that by starting from a statement here from Peter about the best time to buy equities being during drawdowns, during recessions, during that kind of period, right? But how can you do that? How can you buy the thing that is cheap if the thing that is cheap is the thing that you already own, right? So if you have a funded portfolio and that funded portfolio, you know, if, 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 you, try to, uh, how to say, if you try to monetize any of that, you're actually gonna be realizing those losses. So um, how, do we, how do we do that? Now, part of it is a, an asset allocation discussion and we've been talking about Asia exposure. We've been talking about uh, floating rate notes and and uh, certain sectors inside of the equity space, yes. Um, but I also think that portfolio completion solutions, especially those that are based on uh, uh, unfunded return streams, which then allow you to bring in leverage and, uh, uh, and, and so on, uh, have a very good place uh, in, this, in this context, have a very good place in this, uh, in this type of portfolio discussion. Because these are solutions that can Precisely during times when you're witnessing, uh, um, witnessing significant drawdown uh, periods in traditional asset classes, this is when these types of solutions are going to be performing well, right? And what you can do then is construct a rebalancing framework, which removes the need for you to time when you're going to be taking profit on that. You don't know when the crash is going to stop, right? So a rebalancing frequency procedure that allows you to not, uh, not have to decide on, on timing to take profit, but still allows you to gradually take profit on what is performing well during those drawdown periods to then reallocate your capital into uh, uh, funded, uh, funded asset classes, which, which are gonna be very cheap, right? <clears throat> so I just heard sell rallies, don't buy dips. Uh, Peter. To me, it's, it's definitely inflation world we're in. That, that's the paradigm shift. When you look at 40 years of declining rates of inflation that not only um, helped the economy, uh, but it, it altered the, the sort of the playing field of central banks. When inflation is low, it allowed them to experiment with ever new things. Uh, Greenspan broke ground when he cut the Fed funds rate to 1%. You know, that was unheard of. And, but that wasn't good enough for Bernanke, who cut it to zero. And that wasn't good enough for Mario Draghi and others who went into negative territory. And QE and the expansion of, of bank ba uh, central bank balance sheets. And it was low inflation, and it was the excuse of low inflation that they felt they had license to do. And it, what central banks would do ended up driving everything. We, we turned normal economic cycles into credit cycles. Credit cycles that ebbed and flowed with the cost of capital and central bank policy. Fed would ease, growth would happen. Fed would tighten, growth would slow. And inflation is now mud in the gears of not just business, but mud in the gears of central banking. And that sort of that, that, that driver's license is now taken away from them. So that has an influence on their tightening cycle now, but it will also influence how they react to economic, any economic downturn. We're used to, oh, a recession, a slowdown, a bear market in stocks, the Fed's gonna cut, and then we're gonna have a V bottom and everything will be fine. This time around, because I think that inflation is gonna be more persistent and sticky, the Fed is sort of handcuffed into being able to respond to the next downturn, the next crisis, the next recession, that ironically they are then themselves causing. So to me, that's, that's the paradigm shift in the new investing landscape that we live in right now. Danny, last word. So to, to summarize, uh, we essentially are moving from a world of excess supply to a world of excess demand, right? That's essentially what it is. And I know that this is actually something, because well, people always think about excess demand as, oh, People are, want to buy stuff. No, no, no. Excess demand means that people want, there are more people that want to buy than people that want to sell, right? 
Um, so in a world where the supply is constrained, it, there is excess demand by definition, right? And I think that the best picture of that is the, the unseen difference between PMIs and consumer confidence, right? We've never seen something like this, right? Um, in fact, actually, uh, uh, our data is showing that from a flows perspective, the market is priced for a below 50 PMI, right? We are at 55, 56, right? Um, at the same time that consumer confidence is actually below the levels that we saw at the lows in 1980, right? So, so that, that already tells you the difference between one side of the other, right? And this, is, this must be an environment that is good for equities, funnily enough, generally speaking, right? Because, I mean, that means pricing power. That means that, you know, there, there, is, there is a reason to invest. There is a reason to actually uh, be more optimistic if you are uh, a successful entrepreneur. And with that, I want to uh, thank the panelists. I, I know I learned something um, from all of you, and um, so give it up. Thank you. Thank you.